be prepared, be purposeful, and be professional. Welcome to Ultra Habits. Here, we go under the hood with our guests to unpack the minutia and to understand what processes and systems they engage or research that result in ultra-enhanced living. Sandy, welcome to the Ultra Habits show. We are joining each other from across the world. I'm in Melbourne and you're in Massachusetts. Thank God for technology, but uh, really just wanted to welcome you this morning to our show. Well, thank you, RJ. It's really my pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah. So we were just talking a little bit uh, before the show started. Uh, you, you live in Massachusetts. You don't originally hail from Massachusetts. You you said that's where your your parents were from, and I think that's a good place to start. As I understand it, your parents were both chemical engineers. Just really interested to understand how your parents kind of impacted you in terms of your upbringing, and actually what took you to the U.S. Coast Guard. Like, how did you end up there? What a Way to start the story. Thank you for asking. Yeah. So I'll try to make my uh, life story of 62 years very short, <laughs> at least that front part of it, RJ. Yeah. But my mom and dad met at UMass Amherst when they were both young and going to college. But my mom is not a chemical engineer. She'd laugh if she heard you say that. My dad is the chemical engineer. My mom majored in Spanish, but she ended up becoming a homemaker to raise us four kids. So my dad got a job working as a civilian in the U.S. Navy down in Silver Spring, Maryland. And my mom uh, had four kids in pretty quick succession, which is important to my story because I'm the oldest and I'm a girl. And the three successive children, which came within a year apart, were all boys. <laughs> So I was raised in a family of, of uh, mostly men because my brothers all had their friends coming around. And um, I had certainly girlfriends, but I was outnumbered and I was a tomboy. So I would play football with the boys and my parents didn't treat us any different, uh, us, me from my brothers. And my parents were both athletic. They had met, in fact, on the UMass gym team. So my dad had been a gymnast. My mom was doing gymnastics. So they were athletic. And all of us kids were out there playing sports at an early age. I was very shy and unconfident as a girl. I don't know where that came from because my parents are both outgoing. But uh, it was hard for me. And being into um, sports and having three brothers helped me build confidence. And what my parents did for me to role model the way was they set up my core values. So when I wrote this book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters, at the end of my career in the Coast Guard, I had to reflect back on what had helped make me successful throughout my life. And I came back to core values, which are the foundation of your character. And that's how you project as a leader is based on your, your character, be it good or bad. My parents instilled the core values of honesty and humility. And the value of honesty is kids, when they're running around, they're going to be caught in the act of something and, and try to wiggle their way out of it, you know, evade the truth, or maybe even tell a lie. And um, I was caught in a couple of small lies early on as a little girl, five, six years old. And I was so embarrassed to be caught in the lie. So I stole a bird's egg one day out of a nest. <laughs> I was probably five years old. I, I put it in my room and my mother said, where did this bird's egg came from? And I said, well, I found it on the ground. <laughs> well, my mother knew bird's eggs just don't lay around on the ground. I was so embarrassed and um, it's really struck me deep even as a five or six year old. And then humility, my dad, he was from a German descent and he was always telling us kids, don't be too sure of yourself because um, you have to work really hard to get what you want. Everybody around you is gonna be working hard. So you can't just presume that you're gonna be successful or jump to the top because you're you. So he taught us humility. And those two things I think really helped me succeed even when I looked um, back from 40 years of a career in the Coast Guard. So my parents, uh, I think, taught me the core values that I needed to develop as a leader of character. Mm. 
just a quick one on that. Do you think it's easy to like, let's say a young person's raised in a household with values that are in disarray or they're super, they're just not there. Do you think it's easy for individuals to kind of shift their values across time as they evolve or uh, those values are fundamentally set um, at a young age? Like what's your view on an individual's family of origin and the values or lack of values that are placed upon that individual? Like how easy or difficult do you think it is for an individual to shift as they evolve into adults? And that's a really good question. I will start by saying I am not going to be right or wrong on this because you could, it's a great question for debate, six of yeah. one and half a dozen of the other. But I come down on the side, having looked at human nature for 40 years when I was in the Coast Guard, I come down on the side of the fact that every human being has a capability and capacity to be moved and changed and to accept new values as events and circumstances and people in their life influence them. So yes, I had two parents and I, um, they modeled a good role way for me. Uh, and I was able, well, and there were things in my life that weren't the greatest either, but I learned values from those too and learned um, what not to do maybe, because no one's perfect. So my parents had this great role modeling on honesty and humility. But then on the other side, there were things I learned from my folks I didn't want to do, right? <laughs> So I think somebody who's not got the um, benefit of being raised in a family with parents that are there for them, there's other people who can influence. And this is where I love programs like Big Brothers and Big Sisters. I love it that teachers and coaches in school will reach out and try to find the young kids, uh, especially if they're young in elementary school and kindergarten, who need those role models and try to step in because it doesn't have to be parents. It can be coaches, mentors teachers, other family members, interested people who reach out their hand to meet a young person where they are and help that young person develop values that are going to help them be successful in life. Mm. So what moved you towards the Coast Guard? I, I, I would uh, suppose that it was your influence uh, by your dad and, and the influence that obviously that environment would have played upon you but um, that's just an assumption, but is that kind of how it all un kind of evolved? No, you're completely wrong, RJ. That's there not how it went, which I'm go. glad because I like to um, defy convention. That's kind of been there one of my, my things throughout my career is keep them guessing. <laughs> so to, to back up just a little bit, you asked about how I got interested in the Coast Guard. And I, I wanted to finish up that talk on values because I learned the first two core values, honesty and humility from my parents. But there were two other core values that were formative in my life to my success. And they were hard work and perseverance. Mm -hmm. I learned those core values working on farms in the Massachusetts area during the summer. So I'd, I'd go up, my parents would um, drive me up, drop me off. And I'd spend uh, the summer with my grandparents when I was a young teenager, 13, 14, 15, 16, and I worked on a tobacco farm for three years and a cucumber farm. And oh my goodness, farm labor for anybody of your listeners who's ever done that is very arduous. And I was working in fields. This is back in the 1970s. I was working alongside migrant workers. Um, the, the summer workforce was also comprised of um, young juvenile delinquent children, young people who were um, bust in from their delinquency to stay in the UMass Amherst dorms and then work, you know, on farm work for the summer to help them develop maybe good habits, <laughs> give them something else to focus on besides where they came from that might not have been a good background for them. And I, I remember um, having preconceived notions about some of those girls I had to work with and they separated girls and boys on farm work. And I thought, well, these girls, they're juvenile delinquents. They're certainly not going to be uh, good people, but most of those girls, maybe weren't a whole lot different than me. They might've just gotten drawn into a different direction, made a few bad decisions. And goes back to your first question, those girls did have a lot of capacity to become better people with better values or better behaved and make better choices. And I'm sure that many of them did. And I think the farm work might've helped because it teaches you hard work and perseverance. And then uh, when I went into high school, I entered in 1974, and this becomes important because 
somebody's success isn't all about them. It's about the society providing the opportunities, other people helping you. And yeah, there's something in here that matters too, your core values and your character. But I was helped by society. So in 1972, what we had was, um, um, excuse me just a second. In 1972, Title IX in the United States was put in place and that was equal opportunity for girls and women in education. In 1973, in the United States, we had the Equal Rights Amendment passed by Congress. And in 1974, when I came into high school, that meant that I could play sports. And I, I told you earlier, I was an athlete. So I was on track team and we had an actual assigned coach, <laughs> as opposed to the older days when girls teams in high school, just maybe somebody volunteered to chaperone the girls and, and watch them as they worked out. We had a coach. And I actually was able to um, um, be a state champion in my event, which was the discus throw <laughs> of all things. <laughs> and succeeding on the uh, track field helped me to develop the confidence I needed to think that I could apply to, to a, a service academy. So how, how did I join the Coast Guard? In 1976, when I was a junior in high school, following Title IX and the Equal Rights Amendment, Congress forced or mandated that the service academies, the Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Marines, and Coast Guard, the academies that serve all those forces, open their doors to women. And I was living in Maryland in Annapolis where the Naval Academy oh, is right around the corner. So my neighbor one day brought over a newspaper, the Baltimore Sun, and told my mother, hey, Sandy, I know she's a tomboy. She might want to look at this new opportunity for women. And I did. And I was amazed that I could go out and have adventure on the high seas and be part of something bigger than myself, serve my nation. Oh, and the education was free. And if you think about 1976, in our country, we had the oil shock and the recession. It was jobs were limited. And that's why I worked on farm work and money was, you know, non-existent for college. So it was great. And I applied to the Naval Academy. My guidance counselor, who had also been my swimming coach, said, Sandy, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And I'm like, well, PJ, but I want to go to the Naval Academy. He said, well, look at this flyer I got in from this place called the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. And uh, we poured over that flyer and uh, the Coast Guard's smaller than the Navy. But we just decided, well, Coast Guard's a small Navy, which the Coast Guard is not a small Navy. <laughs> it's a whole different set of missions. We do search and rescue, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. We do do Homeland Security and we, we do work with the Navy, but we have our, our own mission sets that keep America safe and secure in the homeland and beyond actually. Um, but I applied there and I got accepted right away because the Coast Guard Academy didn't have a congressional nomination process. And the Navy and the Air Force and the Army Academies all require you to get a senatorial or um, congressional nomination. So it, they go on who you know, not what you know. And the Coast Guard Academy accepted me based on merit. They wanted me because of what I knew, not who I knew. So it was a direct admit. And that appealed to me because I didn't want to have to be in a political process just to get into a college. Mm -hmm. So it kind of went against it, rubbed me wrong a little bit. I, I wanted to be recognized and to get ahead and succeed for who I was and what I knew and what I could do, not who I knew. <laughs> mm -hmm or connections or something else, a factor that I couldn't control. So the merit mattered to me. So that's a bit of a story of how I ended up uh, getting into the Coast Guard Academy as a young girl, the third class of women to attend because they just opened their doors to women. That's a, a fascinating story. So effectively, there was like a pioneering mentality, a willingness to put yourself out there. And I guess a question I have is, when you looked around and, and you would have uh, met other women in your service, as well as the other services that were uh, these uh, pioneers, so to speak, was there similar characteristics amongst you women or were was there a, a real diverse set of women uh, with different reasons and, and characteristics? Was there kind of something that was uh, very similar or, uh, you know, a a trait that was recognizable now when you reflect mm -hmm. upon, you know, those early days when women were just joining the services? It's interesting you see that. So I made it a point to say that I was the oldest of three, of four kids with three brothers. 
two things came to my benefit when I entered the Coast Guard Academy in 1978 and the third class of women, it was a thousand cadets or students and only 5% of us at the time were women. <laughs> but I was used to being the only girl because of being raised with three boys and I was the oldest. So I was used to being first and putting myself out there. And oftentimes my parents would make me go first because I was the oldest. Well, if it's something hard, Sandy has to go first, something easy, or the first one in line for ice cream, that was the youngest. <laughs> so I have met over time other women who were raised with brothers and who were the oldest who succeed in their occupation. So I think that has something to do with it. And at the academy, I believe there were some treats. We entered with 30 women out of a class of about 312 and only 10 of us graduated. The 10 who graduated shared the trait that first came to mind when you asked the question, they shared the trait of being stubborn and not giving up. They persevere. Mm. Mm. We were all different personalities and backgrounds, but we had one thing in common, and that was stick to itiveness or perseverance. Now, we did have a 20 of the women in our, out of 30 did leave. Um, so I can't characterize mm. them as much because mm. some of them left mm. after a few mm -hmm. days. But mm -hmm. the ones who stuck it out had perseverance as their determining quality, which is mm -hmm. one of my core values. That that's super interesting. And I want to, I want to hold there for a minute. So, <clears throat> you know, when we pre the show starting, I kind of told you how I came across your work uh, with Shannon, you guys had a, a leadership forum where I invited some of the young women from my work. And, you know, we have really open dialogue in, our office, sometimes not always politically correct, but we like to have real conversations. And one of the things that I kind of implore to our young women is, yes, there are biases, there are circumstances that we all deal with that aren't necessarily helpful in terms of our cause, but we all have to have the resolution to be determined in our own effort to succeed. So for me, my value is really centered around uh, the individual strengthening myself first, then I can then shift my environment. Mm -hmm. I will not try to change my environment without strengthening myself first. I think that there's, we live in a society that's too focused on too many people yelling about change without being the change they want to see. Now, um, I found it really interesting on the, the call that, um, that you and Shannon and, and the other two women had around leadership, I really felt similar qualities amongst all of you. And there was a doggedness, a perseverance, -ness, a, a toughness there. So how, in your view, can the women of today really uh, be skillful in regards to how they manage the self-efficacy piece and really taking full extreme ownership of their own path without getting bogged down in kind of victim mentality or it's too hard mm -hmm. or like how what's your insight and advice there that's a great question rj and i'm glad you asked that i haven't been asked that question and it's very important i really believe that today we've the pendulum has swung in our society to another um it's all about me generation and we've somehow um, um, hailed victimhood of any kind. And um, I just shrink from that. I'm, I'm a believer in fortitude over fragility and victory over victimhood, all those things, which means that you, you conquer, not be conquered. So I've got um, a little um, lesson that I'll throw out there that I've got a whole speech on this for 45 minutes, so I'll make it short. There's um, three different powers that women can draw upon that, that stem from the power of believing in yourself. And a lot of us women, maybe, um, I've seen this just from my experience, not that you can generalize that everybody's the same. Sometimes women um, are less able to believe in themselves and be themselves than men are. Men kind of come in a little more confident and and um, think a little higher of themselves sometimes. And women struggle. I mean, heck, there's even a term for it. It's um, you feel like the imposter syndrome. So there's a, there's a thing out there that needs to be addressed. And women should understand that this thing out there, whatever you want to call it, I don't like like little. Um, I don't like to use the term really the imposter syndrome because it just kind of focuses in on something. I'd rather look at it just as 
taking control of your own power and believing in yourself and being comfortable being yourself. And that takes some practice. So here's three ways you can do that. There's the power of confidence, the power of being different and the power of perseverance to no um, surprise. And I learned the power of confidence when I was uh, just a young person entering the workforce in, the, in my um, early 20s. I was assigned to my first ship and we're going to Antarctica of all things, RJ. We stopped in New Zealand. I have stopped mm -hmm. in Australia before in Sydney, but we stopped in Wellington. Anyway, going down to Antarctica, do the Coast Guard mission down there, which was to support science research down in Antarctica. <laughs> Break the ice so that the scientists can get resupplied. And I had to stand the watch on the ship, driving the ship, and I had to get qualified to do that on my own, like any other qualification you can think of. And the captain of the ship had to sign a letter saying that I was qualified to stand the watch, keep the ship safe when he wasn't on, you know, on the pilot house. And I spent several weeks uh, training under other people who were qualified. I developed the competence needed to qualify in this in this duty. And I wasn't getting qualified. Um, the people who were um, supervising me were recommending me. She's got every she's completed all the requirements. She's got the competence. My boss wouldn't qualify me. As I went to him and I asked why, and he scratched his head, he couldn't really come up with it and put his finger on it. And I pressed him and he said, you know what, I've got it. He says, I'm not gonna qualify you till you stand on that pilot house with a six gun in each hand, barking orders like John, John Wayne. <laughs> and, well, like John Wayne with a six gun in each hand. And John Wayne was an old Western hero in, in America. And just pick any action hero you want to replace him. So my boss wasn't gonna, qualify me till I stood like an action hero on the bridge, barking orders. And, and that wasn't me. I was a more shy, quiet person. But because I was shy and quiet, it came across that I didn't have the confidence needed for the job. So competence without confidence is not going to get you anywhere. You, they're, they're two sides of the same coin and you can't uncouple them. So sometimes women will be competent. They'll be doing everything in the back room. They'll be great at what they do and they wonder why they don't get picked up for the next level of, of promotion and they look and say well it must be discrimination because i'm a woman well maybe not maybe it's because you don't believe in yourself enough to have the power to project the confidence that's going to make your boss notice that you're ready and that you can take your confidence and apply it to leading others because if you're so unconfident don't believe in yourself are you going to be a good boss or are you going to be as hard on your people as you are on yourself and as unconfident? You're not going to stand up for them if you won't stand up for yourself. Oh my gosh, what a lesson. When I realized all that, it kind of came over me after a day or two of thinking about being John Wayne. I can't be that man. And I had a serenity moment of being comf confident in who I was. And once I started to be myself and believe in myself, I got that qualification within days. And so that's my lesson on the power of confidence. And I've got one on the power of being different and one on the power of perseverance. I'm not sure if we have time, but um, I wanted to leave you at least with that one as a starter for there being a whole um, journey of power that you can harness from within instead of blaming somebody else mm. who can't succeed. Yeah. I, I really love that, Sandy. So I have a, a daughter who's, she's a baby right now, but, um, you know, I am a firm believer as a father. <clears throat> it's my job to kind of help my kids work with what might be some of their blind sides. Or, you know, I know my daughter may come up in, uh, you know, as, as young women do in a society where she may develop this thing where she doesn't put herself out there or, you know, she's competent, but she's not exhibiting the right levels of confidence. And I think it's my duty as a dad, but it's also going to be incumbent on her to then identify that and not expect the world to see that and cater for it without being angry at the world at the same time. Right. So like we all have to take that level of responsibility. She will have to be competent and then also develop the confidence to be able to tell people about it. And if she can't do that, she'll need to realize that the world may not hand her the right opportunities because the world 
doesn't know. No one in the world is going to take the initiative. You've got to take the initiative. Every individual has to take their own initiative. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. And that may seem hard, but that's liberating because it means that you own it, right? The keys Absolutely. are in your hand. And you've got to project that confidence. So even just feeling confident sometimes isn't enough. You've got to, with your professional presence in a space, and, and unfortunately in my mind, a lot of it's too much virtual now, but you can project that confidence in an office, in a virtual space, um, and you have to work on that. It doesn't come natural to some people. So I think that anybody listening to this podcast who, who can recognize something about themselves, hey, I, I can see myself there a little bit, you need to project that confidence. And I think that sometimes even how you dress, um, there's something you say about getting up and making your bed. You have that in the 10 habits. I love it because getting up and putting on uh, an outfit that's not just pajamas can, can sometimes help you project the confidence you need. So how you present yourself helps you exude that confidence and people forget about that or don't even think about it. And again, they're blaming everybody else because they're in um, a pajama looking outfit or something and they're not getting the respect or the attention they think that their ideas need. Maybe it's how you're choosing to project yourself or, or how mm. you start noticing what you need to do to project that confidence and, um, and confidence. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really true. So I, I, I was just looking at my notes and since we're talking about this, I wanted to ask you, what is some wisdom that you would have accumulated over your many years of leading mostly all male teams in the front line? Like what are some advice, I guess you would give to women in leadership roles that, you know, they, they're now been elevated into the leadership team and they look around and their whole team is is effectively males what's some of the wisdom that you would impart to them in regards to well, how do they go about you know uh, establishing themselves as is is a leader and i guess it goes back to your virtues but just in terms of the practical tips sure i have um, a lot of tips and many of them are in in my book uh, which i know you'll put in your show notes but to pull one of them, I, I'm gonna go and follow my theme of the three powers, the power of confidence, the power of being different and the power of perseverance and go to the power of being different. So a lot of women go into a room, they walk into a room and they look around and they're the only woman or there's not many women. And there's a, a conference table, <laughs> or even if you're on the virtual and you've got the boxes that show all the faces and you're the only woman, <laughs> um, some people can get intimidated and this could apply to minorities too i'm just speaking from my perspective as a woman but i learned that there's a power of being different because if you're the different one people notice now this mm. is for better or worse <laughs> so you want to be putting your best self out there but still you're the one i mean what better way to be the center of attention than to be the only woman in the room in my case and i never looked at that way I was always coming into a room, looking around and a little bit, a little bit shy, you know, and ooh, it's all men. And do I feel like I fit? But then I started to realize, wait a minute, because I was the first woman to report to a lot of my ships and you're in an operational environment. You're the first and only woman out of 50 or in one ship, the only woman out of 150 men. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? It's the men who are off balance here because I've kind of been used to being the only woman. Mm. I had these three brothers and um, and then I had a lot of times in the Coast Guard at the Academy and stuff that I was one of the only women. Wait a minute. I kind of understand this dynamic now. It's the men who are off balance. So I, I decided to use that as a power. So when you come into an environment where you're the only woman, help the men to feel comfortable because they also sometimes don't realize what it's like to work with a woman even nowadays i think there's still some un you know they don't have know what to expect help them so break the ice by by being the one who 
introduces yourself around the table. Don't sit there and wait for someone else to reach their hand out to you. And that's the big thing nowadays. Everyone needs to be included and feel included. And yes, ideally, that should be the way it is. But if you're in a room with all men and they're not including you, make the effort to step up and reach your hand out and join a conversation. <laughs> mm. and, um, and, and then kind of help people understand what's appropriate and what's not. And I'll give you an example of that. When I was on a ship and I was the first and only woman on a ship of 50 men out in, uh, on a ship in California. This is back in the 80s when I was young again. <laughs> once, once again, when I was young <laughs> and just learning. And I learned these lessons early on, thankfully. Um, I was the only woman. And, and, um, and one of the guys one night when I was standing on the watch, we were underway, just after a few weeks after I got there, he said to me, you know, man, we love having you on board because a lot of us guys don't want to deal with going down to the, the lunchroom and there's somebody with crude behavior or cussing. And, but we can't say anything or it will lose face, you know? Well, we just can't, we can't do that as other guys. We have to be macho. And um, they said, we can use you as, as an excuse now. <laughs> Miss Doze is here, so we can't do that behavior. And so I'm like, wow, what a, what a revelation. So the next day I get up and I go down to that lunchroom. I'm going to get my coffee or whatever. And I hear one of my guys, and I even remember who it was, it's Kenny. And uh, he's cussing. He says the F word. I said, Kenny, you can't say that. Would you say that in front of your mom or your sister? He's like, oh, well, no, ma'am. Well, I'm like, well, you can't say it in front of me either. And I did it in a light way so that yeah. people on the mess deck laughed. Everybody else laughed. And I didn't drill Kenny down and make him feel like mm. a loser and make him lose face. I did no. it lightly and I, 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 I wanted to keep an environment where people, it's like, oh, Miss Stoza's here and oh, she's not gonna, oh, well, we know what to expect now. So it's, it's not that hard, but I think it takes some experience to know that. And Mike, the guy who I was standing watch with that night on the bridge, <laughs> the, the person who <coughs> that they liked having me on board, he gave me that hint and I wouldn't have known otherwise that some of the guys were wondering and that they were using me as an excuse. So anyway, the power of being different, I think is really, really important. And, and um, I'll follow that on with when women are walking into that conference room, certainly the story I just told you was walking onto a ship. When you're walking into that conference room and you're going to be part of a group that's almost all men. Um, well, there's three things you can do. You can, Present yourself, the three Ps, be prepared, be purposeful, and be professional. So you want to um, get along with the guys in the room and have a voice, because a lot of women say, well, I have no voice because it's all men. Be prepared. So look at the agenda, look at the people attending, find out where those people stand, because you're probably going to have some insights into that. Get their bios, do the research that maybe a lot of the men aren't even doing. And then you'll kind of know who's got what um, experience in this area of the, of the agenda. You might then be able to be purposeful, my next P, and interject a meaningful comment somewhere because you've done your research. And other people might not have anything to say at the time because they don't have that benefit of the preparedness. And then being professional is you look for ways you can support some of the men. Like if a man has an idea and they present it, maybe just say, hey, that's a great idea, Joe. I think uh, you, you are, you're very insightful. Mm -hmm. And then maybe Joe will support you when you try to make a comment, because all of us women have felt this. You're talked over. Even when I got to be a senior officer in the Coast Guard, an executive level person, if I was in the room with all men, I would feel it. They were talking over me. Why? Partly because I wasn't leaning in to get my voice in the conversation and they had no hesitancy about that. I was doing the polite thing like a woman might do, waiting for an mm -hmm. opening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're in a room with a bunch of men who are very uh, mm -hmm. extroverted, they're not gonna, there's not mm -hmm. gonna be a moment of silence. So you kind of have to strategically make a point, but you can't just say something, anything, or else you'll look stupid. You have to say something purposeful, which goes back to being prepared. So when you do speak, you say something that matters that people listen to. Now we've all also had um, that comment goes silent and the guys keep going around the table and some other guy mentions your idea two people later. 
All of us women have had that happen and probably minorities too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, and that's frustrating, but nothing's perfect. And I think mm -hmm. if you follow these three P's of being prepared, being purposeful and being professional, you will stand a much better chance of being seen and heard at that table and being different, I think does give you an inside advantage, but it takes some experience to get used to, um, playing that deck of cards. But the key is to play that deck of cards, not to sit there and sulk because you feel like you're not being included. Mm -hmm. There's so much in that, Sandy. I mean, <clears throat> one, it's identifying your point of difference and then leveraging from a point of strength with intentionality. Because now that the spotlight's on you, you have to have your, your stuff together, right? Like the spotlight's gonna be on you. You're gonna have to be prepared and ready more so than maybe that male who can kind of wing it get to the meeting and blurb his opinion on the spot with no real value. Uh, whereas what you say, the spotlight on you is going to be maybe viewed uh, with, with, you know, uh, with uh, lenses that aren't going to be the same in terms of if a man says it, but that can be leveraged uh, is a position of strength. And I, and I really love that. It just goes back to having intention and having that level of ownership um, and agency versus um, again, kind of expecting anything from the environment. And uh, I really like that message. One of the things in your, uh, your, on your website, you talk about servant leadership. Now I hear a lot about that. How would you define servant leadership um, in, in your own words? So the reason I put servant leader author is my tagline for my website is because I believe that I got to the top, you know, the highest levels of the Coast Guard, the executive levels from learning how to serve um, because it's easy to get caught up in leading and there's all these, this talk about leading and, and we all think of service. Well, heck you're serving in the Coast Guard and sure I served in the Coast Guard, served the people of America. Um, but you have to translate that servant service to, to how you lead and serving your people well is the key. So it's not all about them serving you. It's about you serving them. And I'll give you an example. <laughs> um, there was a time when I was uh, on a ship as I was commanding officer of the ship, which meant I was the person in charge. And my men were doing a great big engine. I was the only woman, by the way, <laughs> on the ship my men were doing a big engine overhaul of our main diesel engine. And the engineer officer came to me one day and um, wanted money for new tools. And he had um, a proposal for me to buy like snap on tools, pick the most expensive brand of tools you can think of. So he could have his engineers have these tools for the, for the engine overhaul. And I'm like, well, EO engineer officer, can't you um, go buy them from Sears or something a little bit cheaper? Because we're on a budget here. And I was just thinking of the practical element yeah. of being a leader who looks out for the budget and all that. And he just kind of rolled his eyes and he thankfully spoke truth to power. He said, ma'am, he said, those men come into work early in the morning every day and they're going to spend the whole day there away from their families, greasy in an engine room with diesel fuel smell and they're going to go home to their families dirty and late at night because we have to get this overhaul done in a limited period of time and all they want is good tools to do their job mm -hmm. if i give them snap-on tools it means that i value them and i care enough about them to give them the best tools so they can give their best labor to that job and so he was wanting to serve his people good tools and I needed to be a servant mindset, not just a budget mindset, that I needed to find a way to provide my people, serve them with this, with what they needed to get the job done. And I think a lot of people don't learn that lesson. And I thank that engineer officer for teaching me <laughs> that lesson, which was repeated time and time and time again about how if a leader wants to succeed and get the best out of their people, they will learn how to serve those people in so many different ways. That's just one small example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that. So I'm going to move the conversation to the topic of change, right? So like, there's a lot of language out there today, whether it's true or not, that, you know, change is happening at a pace that it's never had. I, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, it, it tends to be 
what we hear that, you know, there's change is rapid. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the kind of the landscape is becoming even more uncertain in or on your website, you wrote something that was really, uh, really well written. In my view, you, you said today, our nation is like a ship being tossed in tumultuous seas, the winds and waves of change had divided it and distanced our society, threatening to wash away the very principles upon which our nation was founded. Now, I, I kind of want to talk at a societal level um, as you know, a nation is a world and this topic of change. Uh, do you think that we've become less capable of dealing with change? Do you think our values are in disarray? Do you think there's just too many opinions and they're all too loud? Like, what's your view on this topic of change and uh, and kind of what seems to be an instability around it, certainly politically and in many other ways around the world. What's your philosophical view, uh, Sandy? It okay. So this is um, a complex equation um, that that is at work in the world right now. And there's, uh, in my opinion, and there's certainly a lot of opinions out there. And this could also be a thesis, not just a, a five or a three minute answer. But I think that in our country, there has been a lot of change over the past generation. We had the industrial revolution. And from there on, we've moved into the tech revolution. We've become a very prosperous society. So what I dealt with as a cadet at the Coast Guard Academy 40 some odd years ago, uh, what they deal with today pales in comparison. But you would think that it's worse talking to people because in a more prosperous society, expectations seem to get higher <laughs> mm. because mm. you have less, it's the Maslow's scale of needs. Mm. If you're at the bottom of it, where you're just looking for food and clothing every day, you don't have time to worry about um, all the drama that might be going on. Um, so you've got now the tech revolution where everybody can have an opinion and a voice and they can see anything and everything that, that is going on on social media, much of it which isn't true, and much of it which is misleading, much of it which the advertising is targeted to keep on building up your biases. So there's a bias that you've got, whatever it might be, all of us have them, and the advertising will build that bias instead of trying to distribute and give you better information that makes you a more, um, uh, understanding person, they'll make you a more narrow-minded person. <laughs> <laughs> what I see is um, this whole globalization hasn't worked for, for a lot of the world because it's left some behind and made others really prosperous. So there's a division there. And there's uh, two kinds of people. There's those who want to divide and weaken our society, I think, and those who want to unite and strengthen it around a common purpose and shared values, like I think how the nation was founded. And I think we're getting away from that in some areas and we can't let diversity drive us apart. Diversity um, accelerated or amplified by technology and, and some of the other factors in that equation. We have to, I think, whether it's in our home, whether it's in our workplace or whether it's in our nation or the world, focus on um, a shared values and purpose that will unite us in a common cause, a common mission, something to unite and strengthen us as a people, not divide and weaken us. So great. It's great to have um, arguments and debates, and I mean, pr productive, respectful arguments. So one thing I would say is that with change all around us, much of it that we can't control, we feel out of control because we can see everything, but we can't do anything about it. Like take the war in Ukraine, even for instance, is a big issue. And then down to small issues that we feel like we can't do anything about that we'd like to change in our society. And I think that uh, we get frustrated by that instead of um, trying to look at the, um, the ways that we can make a difference in our own space. We look at the whole bigger picture and it divides us against each other instead of um, seeking with respect to understand somebody else's opinion we seek to undermine somebody else's opinion. And in, everyone should be out there in a civil society seeking the differences in opinions uh, that are brought on by change and, and turbulent times 
and seeking to respectfully understand why the person thinks that way, not immediately going to undermining them. So I think that I would lay that out there as, as um, some thoughts on where we are. And I think that in a society where change is prevalent, everyone needs to understand that and realize you've got to anticipate what's coming next because the COVID and everything that's happened is, is not the last of it. It'll more will come around, anticipate what could be coming next, adapt, adjust, and, um, and, um, oh dear, and be agile. So I have four A's there, anticipate, adapt, adjust, and be agile. And if people can have a mindset of that, it will help them focus on what they can do to move through change. And then if they focus on the other side of that coin, having respectful conversations that try to unite and strengthen everybody around shared purposes, because we're all looking for a better America. Um, I know that's kind of rambling a little bit. Um, I would no, have to put no. it all out in a thesis to make it more sensible. No, but it's a, it was a very, it was a very good answer to a, a philosophical question. I think that really what I've loved about your message and the reason I wanted to ask you that question, I, you know, I debated as to whether I would ask it is I think you tackled the subject of change again with the owning your own part in it. So like, what can I do in this situation? Not thinking about the global context, but like, how do I be the change I may want to see? And I think that if enough people do that, that's the anecdote, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. I think you articulated that really well. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to start to land this plane, Sandy. I, I really loved having you on the show. Um, lots of wisdom, lots of knowledge. I always love talking to women in the military, um, particularly women like yourself that went in early uh, when there wouldn't have been a lot of opportunity because I think there's a certain level of strength that you bring to the show um, and illustrative examples which you brought today. But before we wrap up, I always ask our guests, particularly I guess with your context of being on the ships and being in the Coast Guard, what are some of the habits that you picked up in your career, um, whether it was a Coast Guard or any kind of personal habits that you have and that you live by on a day to day basis that have made you a stronger person and a better leader? And I'm going to answer that, RJ, um, what first comes into my head, because I've been successful with that throughout my career. Otherwise, you just kind of. Um, stammer around for this perfect answer. But the first thing that comes into my head is, and, and, and it's, it's one of yours too, is wake up early. <laughs> mm. So in a high stress environment where there's change all around, it's turbulent times, you feel like you don't have control. I'm sure that some of your listeners can relate to that with the COVID and everything else that's been going on, just watching helplessly events um, in, at home and abroad. If you get up early, you get a head start on the day and you can do something you want to do. In my case, I get up early and I exercise for an hour. If I have a pool, which um, I don't right now because I just moved and they don't have a pool here. I swim for a mile. I walk for an hour. I do yoga for an hour. Do something for yourself that gets you um, active and you feel like you've gotten that behind you now because if you wait to do your exercise or take time for yourself until later in the day that time will slip away and then you'll be more frustrated so get up early so that you can do what you want to do and then another thing that's helped me over time is be continually grateful and i learned this um 20 years ago when i had a um holistic um resort that I went to, Canyon Ranch in the Berkshires, by the way. And uh, the speaker, a motivational speaker came and talked about a gratitude journal. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how to be grateful. And he said, do five things a day and don't ever repeat anything. And I'm like, oh, because otherwise you're just saying I'm grateful for the same thing every day. So I'd find myself, I remember one day I went out to walk to work. Um, at the time I could walk to work and it was a, a dewy, wet morning, but the sun was coming out. And I saw a perfect spider's web with dewdrops outlining the whole entire thing with the sun on it. And I'm like, it stopped in my tracks. And I started this urge, surge of gratitude came out of my being about nature and God and the spider. And it just, <laughs> 
it just, uh, I know it sounds a little corny to some people, but my whole spirit was freshened and renewed for the day. And that was my gratitude, uh, my new gratitude uh, item for the, for the day. But renewing your spirit through gratitude, RJ, that is so important in these times. Mm, that's beautiful. That really is. I think, I think there's, it's interesting the, the, the story here about the, the spider's web. I think there's a connection as well that happens with kind of that natural and natural piece as well that really brings you back to yourself and to your spirit. And I think there's something really in that. But um, I, I really want to thank you for our time together, Sandy. Where can our audience find you? They're going to want to learn more. Where can they actually find you? Well, thanks for giving me that chance. They can find me at www.sandrastows.com, my, my whole name without any punctuation. And I also do a weekly leading with character blog that has a topic every week. If they want, they can get onto that website, go to the bottom of any page and sign up for my mailing list. And you'll get a one weekly email that has my blog. And my book is available on my website. It's called Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass. Leading in Uncharted Waters. It's a book on character center leadership. And it's not a memoir. It's a book on leadership that tells leadership lessons through my stories and experiences over 40 years in uniform with the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, RJ. It's been wonderful being on your show.